Hi there, welcome again to another um, circus rigging and safety session that we're uh, uh, doing this time on inspections. So quick introduction to those of you who don't know us about circus rigging and safety. Um, we have a website which is designed to give information to the public about safety in circus. Um, in addition to that, we have a group of members who help us out with producing a lot of that content, um, vetting it, um, checking in on it and giving us feedback on it, or um, people who just want to get access to some of the more uh, member related information. So public safety stuff we like to make public, uh, stuff that's in the members area tends to deal more with professional development um, and also allows us to network together with different um, riggers um, about circus safety. So some of the stuff we've published in the last month since uh, we've been, uh, since our last live stream, um, we finally um, put up the uh, setting up the no fit state circus tent, which we were working on last year. Um, we have just published the rigging in the entertainment industry course, um, a review on that as part of our um, series of courses that we are looking to do on training relating to rigging. Um, and we've got a couple more which are due to come out in the next um, week or so, which I'll talk to about at the end. But first of all, let's give a warm welcome to Chris Higgs. Hi, Chris. How are you doing? Afternoon, everybody. Very well, thank you. Good, good, good. So um, thank you for joining us again uh, very much. Now, um, when we were looking for some uh, good ways to talk about inspections and to us to do inspections, um, you came up with this concept. <laughs> it's all my fault. <laughs> I'm sure you hear that a lot because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I certainly do um, good so I mean this is a I, I thought this was a really nice idea because this um, allows us to take people who are not riggers um, uh, put in front of them different bits of equipment um, and take them through um, a rigging inspection for all the things that we should be checking um, as we do so um, so uh, where would you like to begin um, with this well, I, by the sound of it, we can we've got a sort of a um, what's the word a bird's eye view of some equipment. So I guess the first thing to do is just to go and see if we can catch sight of some round slings. <laughs> I think we can manage to do that. So all right. So first of all, let's uh, introduce you to some of the Aerial Edge team um, who are currently in um, the new Aerial Edge venue. Uh, we have uh, Gabriel, we have Helen, and we have Heidi. And um, between us, um, we'll be um, hauling out various different bits of equipment. Um, if you'd like to give a quick introduction to um, Aerial Edge, the venue, um, can we have a look and see where you're at? Just a second, let me flip this. Okay. That's it, very nice. So uh, we can see all the way down through um, uh, through Aerial Edge from there. So some of the stuff that we can be looking at if we want to is already rigged and in situ. We've got a tumble track which is under construction over the back. Um, we've got the, um, yeah, go, go left from there. And then we've got the, um, uh, the static rig. Um, and then beyond that, we've got a fly rig and cradle, a petit volant in development. Um, there is a piece of equipment that Gab is walking towards at the moment, which is a teeter board. Um, I do inspect that on a regular basis, um, but that was again another piece of manufactured circus equipment, which I think it will be interesting um, to have that as part of this discussion later on. Um, how about we, um, uh, so if we could then um, start as Chris suggested by pulling out some round slings um, and start having a look at some of those and see what we want to do next. It's always interesting to see how people store these things as well. IKEA bags is the key. Absolutely. <laughs> Good. So um, we've put a few ringers in, uh, Chris. Just <laughs> you know, just just Johnny just to Gun. keep you on your toes. Yeah, so, very good. So would you like okay. to? Yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah. I see this very much as a sort of a series of filters, um, and the, the really very first thing to do is make sure that what you've picked up is yours. And by that, I mean it belongs to the, the organization or belongs to yourself um, for several reasons, because if it is yours, then you should have some supporting paperwork to go with it, um, which will give you all sorts of useful information, it's like, like when you bought it. So first of all, can we identify that as belonging to Aerial Edge? We absolutely cannot at this stage. <laughs> right. We've failed at okay, the first so hurdle. 
<laughs> Indeed. Now, there may be nothing wrong with it at all, and it may be that for whatever reason you just lost the, the serial number or whatever. So I wouldn't necessarily throw it away, but that's the first um, filter, if you like. The second one would be the label that the manufacturer has put on there, which you can see very often protected by some polythene or something like that. So the first thing is that it is, it is actually present. And, we have a label. Um, excellent. And can we read what the label says? I think once we scrape a bit of grime off it, I think that we can actually get uh, to that. So we can see, what can we see there, Heidi? What's, uh, who's the manufacturer? Um, SHS. SHS, okay. I'm not familiar with that particular uh, manufacturer. What, what, what are we going to look for on the, on, on the label in particular, Chris? Well, I think the next thing is to make sure that there is a serial number which the manufacturer, nine, 99 times out of 100 manufacturers will put the serial number on. Can we zoom in Can we zoom in on that just a little bit so we can get and see it from the camera player? Feel free to pull that label um, all the way out um, if you want to get it out of the thing. Feel free to tear it right now if you want to. Um, not standard I I equipment, but I, I happen to know a little bit about this particular sling. <laughs> Okay, so can we see a serial number there? Yeah, second one down, I think. Isn't that T560504? Nice and clear. Yep, that's now, all good. Other information on there, If we've got to make some assumptions here. So we're using this to support some um, aerial equipment like a silk or a cord lease or something like that. So it's not necessarily going to be used as lifting equipment, but it's still being used in a work environment. So it should really have a CE mark on it, which I can see. Yep, I can see that sort of about near so the bottom. Good. You can see there's a lot of other information there, um, and probably the most um, important one to us right now is the fact that it has a working load limit of two tons, and you can see that that's very clear, um, it's present and it's legible. That's really important. That's um, good. The length, that's obviously useful to know, but to be honest, if you just pulled it out of your IKEA bag and you can't <laughs> tell it's two meters long. <laughs> Um, even if it's been badly stretched, it's unlikely that it's going to be uh, so long that you can't determine whether it's two metres or not. Um, it's quite useful that you've actually got Scotia Handling Services phone number there as well, assuming they're still in existence, which I'm sure they are. Um, because if you've got any questions, you can phone them up. And that's yep. why the cheap, cheap kit that might just say, perhaps just the country where it was made, is not very helpful. Now, right down the bottom there, tucked away under your left thumb, more or less, it says safety factor as well, which is worth knowing, isn't it? And it should say seven to one. I think it does. And there it goes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, nice. fantastic news. Um, let's just have a look at the back of that label in case somebody's written aerial edge on it. <laughs> uh, it doesn't look like they have. But what you've got instead, yeah. which is what you'd expect, and if it's been marked, it should contain that information. In your language as well. Um, yep. That's why there's very little in terms of um, text there. It's mainly graphics. And that gives you an indication as to the different, what they call mode factors, which we haven't got time for now. But you can see what's being called a straight pull. Um, it's a two ton working load limit. So on a straight pull, as indicated, between two thumbs, as it were, um, you can put two tons on it. Now, the important thing is that it says 2T, not two dot and then a blur. Yeah. Um, and it's obviously 1.6 when you choke it rather than is that an 8 is that a 2 you know it's clearly 1.6 um, the rest of it to be honest if you knew what you were doing you could probably infer from the two tons but the important thing is that that bottom row of that little chart there is a it's there and b it's legible okay so that's a requirement um, uh, in this that we actually make that legible I wasn't aware of that yes absolutely Okay. Um, as I say, if you know what you're doing, a competent person should be able to work the rest out. But if you've yeah. got two tons as a straight pull, um, the intention being that the user might not be a, for want of a better word, a rigging engineer, lifting engineer. Um, it might be somebody installing, installing pipe work or something, but they're obviously able to use a sling. And yeah. it just gives you that information. So the same as on the reverse. It's all um, useful information, but it's not useful if you can't read it. So it's got to be present. It's got to be legible. Yeah. Um, if you were using it for lifting, it must have the working load in it, it must have a serial number, uh, and it must have a CE mark, and any um, information as you can see there. And obviously it is designed to be lifting equipment, we just use it for something slightly different. Indeed. Um, nonetheless, good information, and it's all present, and it's all legible. So there's one piece so of information... The next filter we've been oh, through. yeah, yes please. 
and we've not even started to look at the condition yet. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. So the next thing to do is to find a fixed point that we can work from, a datum point, if you like. And I normally use the join in the outer sheet where the stitching is, joins it together, which is very usually where the label is because these things are not expensive. And if you can make the, the join do several jobs, i.e. the stitching holds the label in as well, then fantastic. Mm -hmm. Now you can see it's got a green sheath, which in industry indicates it's a two ton working load limit. If it was a one ton limit, it would be purple. If it was a three ton limit, it would be yellow. The outer sheath. Uh, a lot of people use black in our industry, as I'm sure you know. So you even more reason to always refer to the label. So your visual inspection, it's once you get used to doing it, it's a visual and tactile inspection at the same time. You started at a fixed spot so that you don't waste your time. Um, if that label was a, a donut around the sling, you could work your way around the sling and never come back to the donut, as it were, because it will stay at the lowest point. Um, if you've got a very long sling and you've got a lot to do, it saves you a lot of time. Yeah. So work your way along the sling there. And what you're looking for in the outer cover all the way around is cuts to the sheath or heat damage, which will normally look like when you melt the end of a rope to stop it fraying. Just keep going on the side with the two stripes. And as you go around, you're probably feeling a lump around that point, mm -hmm. which is to be expected. Can you feel a big lump? Um, yeah, it's a bit it might be the same sort of distance the other side of the joint if you can't feel it. Now let's keep going around and we'll count the lumps when we get there. So you're looking for cuts, you're looking for tears. So keep going around. You can do about, I don't know, about three, 30 centimetres a time, I suppose. Something like that. So, and you're feeling there. it as you're going. Yeah, there's a lump. Absolutely. So there's another one. Now you've come around to the cable tie, which I'm assuming indicates its inspection status, which we'll talk about in a bit. That's not obscuring any defect, is it? We can move it so we can see underneath it. It's not as if it's mm -hmm. attached somewhere. That's it. Keep going around. Again, looking for cuts and tears. And now you're back where you started. So now turn the sling over 180 degrees and do the same on the inside, on the side without the stripes. And I know it may seem a bit um, laborious, but it's the only way to be sure, isn't it? So all the way around again, just the same as you did before. So looking for tears, cuts, possibly any powdery deposits on it, which might indicate chemical damage. Unlikely, but not impossible. You've left it in a cleaner's cupboard or something. It's primarily cuts that you're looking for. And if you see a cut, a hole, you need to be looking for the white yarn inside. And it's really quite visible. There's a little snake by the look of it. That's, can you pull that out with your finger? One loop of thread, isn't it? Yeah. And if you, if you look at the hole that you've made, can you see any white, I mean, literally quite bright white fibers? I can't. Yeah. yeah. So that's just. Audio. Two small ones. Somebody's written a number on there. I wonder if that number corresponds with any number on the label. Or is it somebody's name? It can be a bit forensic sometimes. It goes with someone, someone's name or code. Relate to the serial number in any way? I can't read what it says from here. It says G S R L O five. B S R G S R B O five. Since I ring the bell. Since I don't recognise this, um, <laughs> this may be an inherited one. Very good. And you're back at the join. Now you see the stitching there. Mm -hmm. That stitching just holds the two ends of the sheath where one's been passed inside the other together. So really, it's not critical unless it's starting to allow the two sides of the tube, the sheathing tube, to pull apart. And that clearly isn't. So if you do find a few pulled threads there, it's not the end of the world at all. If there's a great straggly long bit, you probably don't want it there anyway. 
Um, but that is really a good indication that it's on its way out and you'll find that eventually it'll allow the, uh, the join to separate and you'll be able to see the yarn inside. Now the lump that you probably found fairly close, and I'm imagining you've got your thumb on one now, haven't you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Come a bit more towards you. Can you feel a lump inside? Maybe a bit yeah. further on. Keep going round, back there. Yeah. Now, if you feel it carefully, if I explain to you that it's almost certainly the end of the tube that goes inside to, to make like a bodkin to push it in has been created with PVC tape. So they've actually tapered the end and then slid the other part of the tube over the top and then run through it, run it through the sewing machine. Right. So that's what you can feel there. Now, if you found something like that somewhere else in the sling, in other words, away from the join, then that's something to be concerned about. Sometimes you find two smaller versions of that, and that's where they've taped the ends of the coil of yarn to itself inside the sling. So occasionally you'll find, not always, it depends on the quality of the sling, to be honest, sometimes they're paper masking tape, uh, but that's what's going on inside. So by the look of it, we didn't find any other lumps or bumps. There's nothing got stuck inside it that you'd have felt as you, you gave it the tactile inspection as you went round. So there's no splinters, so to speak. Um, there's no cuts, importantly, so you're not exposing the load-bearing yarn to um, abrasion or, or cuts from a sharp edge or something like that. And there's no heat or chemical damage that we can see either. So provided that meets the criteria for the school, you can now record all that information on a, a register um, and say that it's passed its test. If you've got the supporting paperwork. Ah, now um, I'm thinking that we probably don't have the supporting paperwork, but I'm also thinking that... Of course, as um, far as we know, uh, you don't have the supporting paperwork. Um, the other question is on dates. So when we're looking at fabric slings like this, I think, it, uh, am I right in saying it's down to the manufacturer's recommendations um, for, the, for when you retire a sling as far as um, duration is concerned? With a round sling, the UV degradation we hear so much about is allegedly not really an issue at all. Okay. Um, the, the, the largest manufacturer there is told me some probably 15 years ago now that they've got no experience of UV uh, damage penetrating through the, the outer sheath to the load-bearing fibres. If you've got a webbing sling, yeah. as in a harness yeah. webbing or um, for rest webbing, that kind of thing, yeah. or even yeah. a, a lighter weight anchor sling, then the webbing that you can see, the fibres that you can see, are the ones that the UV hits. But right. the round sling is, is protected from that um, UV Indeed. radiation. So um, if you had one of these that was 20 years old, would you... Mm. Um, uh, would you just base it based on the fact whether you uh, all the criteria that we've currently covered um, or because I know that some manufacturers recommend that they retire their round slings after seven years yeah I mean I think given the use that we're putting them to um, and the cost that they are you know if they cost a thousand pounds each it might be slightly different yeah um, but in the case of um, aerial work it's obviously critical um, I don't think anybody's got any actual evidence of it being an issue indoors with a round yeah. sling. No. Um, but better safe than sorry. Yeah, indeed. Know? So, I mean, uh, is that the criteria that they've, that they've um, developed those retiree dates around? Um, it's, it's UV. Um, UV not degradation, yeah, right. absolutely. Okay. If the Good sling's stuff. made of polyamide, so if we think about the, the black and yellow flecked slings that so many yeah. people yeah. use for sort of accessories, yeah. then that's not polyester. This is made from polyester, and you can see that one, the rope assemblies one, almost certainly has either PES yeah. or the fact yeah. that this, the, the label that the sling is made from, uh, sorry, the, the, start again, the PVC that the label is made from is blue. Yeah. And the blue colour indicates the material of manufacture. Huh. And in this case, it's polyester, but I think you'll find on there it also says PES, which stands for polyester. Very good. Um, so that gives you the, the material of manufacture that you can then check the application that you've got um, that it's appropriate to that because some things you are more heat sensitive or less heat sensitive, etc. Yeah, there you go. PES, as it's written on there. Very good. Yep, usually is. Um, Excellent. You, you've got a data manufacturer as well. Well, that's nice to know, isn't it? I mean, if it's yeah. a batch that you bought. 10 years ago, as you say, and you're quite comfortable it's in good condition, but risk management wise, you might yeah. think, well, it really isn't worth the risk. Yeah, um, for, the, for, for the sake of two or three pounds. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Get rid. 
Yeah, exactly. And um, we had that exact same situation post-pandemic. Um, equipment hadn't been inspected for two years, so we had yep. uh, a lot of equipment which had expired, and we took the choice to um, uh, to mm-hmm. get rid of them because we didn't have any other way of going, uh, yep. you know, it, for, for obvious reasons. I mean, if you've got a lot of equipment, it's probably worth being a little more sort of pedantic about it and not just replacing. But yeah. frequently, it's actually cheaper just to buy a new one. Yeah. Yeah. You know, make it impossible to use. Think of wildlife if you discard it, if you chuck it in a skip, chop it up into short bits. But, you know, try not to put it somewhere where birds can get at it because it doesn't do them any good at all. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Um, shall we move on to something else? Yeah, absolutely. What would you like yeah. to see next? Well, I think for me, the, the most likely thing is probably a connector of some sort, a yeah. carabiner or a mile. So um, do you want to take a, a trip down to the uh, the carabiner department? So this is well, like, great videography. <laughs> Taking you on a journey. Oh, great PR for Aerial Edge. <laughs> Did you put that on <laughs> deliberately, Heidi? It looks really good. <laughs> she didn't. <laughs> you, you reminded constantly all this equipment you can see is somewhere called Aerial Edge. Uh, I think that sounds like a good thing. So um, uh, one, once we dug all of our stuff out of storage, we decided to uh, actually start to sort of categorize it and look after it a little bit. And uh, yep. we pulled a few things out as samples both uh, here and on the ground. So we've got um, a few interesting um, things there to, to have a look at. I, I suspect you want to have a look at either a... A car- probably a carabiner or a bow shackle or something like that first. Yeah, I think a carabine is going to be of most relevance to most people watching. Okay. Um, I don't really mind what, what type we've got. Um, the principles are exactly the same. I think the, the thing to bear in mind really with all this stuff is give yourself enough time to do it properly and find somewhere where it's, um, the right word, sort of ergonomically um, appropriate so you don't feel like your arms are getting tired you've got a bench to put things on yeah a chair to sit on an angle poise possibly a magnifying glass to hand or even a measuring um, device of some sort bernier gauge or something like that um but what you're actually going to do is exactly the same as we did with the round sling um a little more difficult with some metal items because very often they don't have quite as much information as easily visible but what you should be able to see straight away is whether it's got a CE mark. And if it has a CE mark, and that might have on the other side. Can we just turn it over, please, and have a look at the other side? There you go. Yeah, we've got a CE, and it, that CE mark is also followed by four digits, which I'm... 0082. It is 82, is it? Right. So that's a company in France called the Parve Sud. And they are what they used to call the notified body back in the CE days pre-Brexit for us. Um, on the other side, I noticed it said EN362, which is the standard that you must meet as a manufacturer if you're producing carabiners or connectors, I should say, um, for use in a fall arrest system. So that says EN362 colon 2001, is that, or 2002? Looks like 2001. 2001, and then there's a... Slash B? Slash B. Well, the B is the type of connector, and the standard was 2001. So don't get confused and think that that's a serial number. You're very often doing assessments. You look down at people's PPE records, and sometimes uh, shackles as well, and you'll see CE0082 against every single (laughs) item on the record. Um, (laughs) Yeah. So EN362-2001 slash B, that's the standard that the carabine has been made to. You've then got an arrow indicating force being applied on the long axis. So there's a, an arrow head each end, which is perhaps not quite so easy to make out. And then it says 25 kilonewtons. 2004, that says. Oh, it is 2004. Yeah, I can That's see it better light now. It looked like a one. It did look like a one. <laughs> you never know. You never know. Um, 25 kilonewtons, um, and that indicates the carabine or the connector's breaking load in that direction. So if you clip that between two cart horses and those cart horses pull apart from each other um, when you get to two and a half tons which is essentially what 25 kilonewtons is um, there's a strong chance that the carabiner will have reached the point at which it can't sustain the force and then next to the 25 kilonewton mark um, that stamp is a little it's one of those sort of read the information type icons isn't it it is there's a book with an eye in it two sides of pages of a book with either an exclamation mark or an information 
I, a bit like a road sign. So that tells you that there is a manual, um, or at least instructions for safe use. Very nice. Um, if we can flip over to the other side again, please. Lovely job. Um, what else can we pick up from there? Um, could we zoom in a little bit closer if possible? Not to necessarily lose focus. So C0082 we talked about, that's the notified body that have done the um, the quality assurance, if you like. Um, the rest in the middle, I read that well from here. I'd get a piece of chalk and rub it over the top so that that leaps out at you. Yeah, quite a good <laughs> actually, that's a good idea. Or a Sharpie or something yeah. like that. doesn't matter now. Um, but that will normally disclose the model number, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I'm not seeing serial maker, numbers on these. No, indeed. The, there's probably a maker's mark there, and I would imagine that the batch information is in the middle. Um, yeah, sometimes, can we revert, just turn it through 90 degrees so I can look at the back of the spine, or what, the other side? That just way. The invert, that's there you it. Go. There's nothing in there, is there? No. Nope. Uh, okay. <laughs> now, you'll notice that I'm ignoring completely the, the condition that the carabine is in at this point. Yeah, because I'm very gracious. <laughs> <laughs> trying to find out who made it because then I know which manufacturer's website to go to or, or manual to pull out the, the office drawer as it were. So let's go back um, to a sort of a, a side on view please a plan view as it were, that's it um, we've got as much information from that as we can though I think, so the, the time's come to look at the general overall condition of it. Um, what I recommend with carabiners, particularly an oval one of that particular shape is does it look reasonably symmetrical so if you hold it the other way around the tall ways that's right and try and sort of imagine a mirror image of the curve is it a constant curve and it does look as if it's undeformed to me um, the next thing I'd do would be to snap the gate open and shut and that tells me does it open right the way back does it feel stiffer the further back you go and then Ooh. let it go with a sharp snap yeah, so it doesn't look as if there's any problem with the spring. Um, as they get older and weaker, the spring tends to wear and that, that uh, closing action won't be as good. The next thing you want to do is screw up the, the screw gate to make sure it travels the whole way and then it's free to travel and then it tightens up at the end, just sort of hand tight, and then try and open it again without, without undoing the gate. So screw it up and then try and open it. Sorry, I didn't explain that too well. <laughs> that's it. Now try and open it by just pulling the gate. That's it. Make sure it's an effective lock. Because what can happen often, the material is quite thin on the sleeve, and you can actually get chips, which means that if you're unlucky, it corresponds with the nose of the carabiner and still allows the gate to open. Mm. seen that quite a few times when they get biffed on things. So we're fairly sure now that the, um, the device locks when it's closed. Now we need to look at the pins the one that forms the hinge and the one at the other end which locates into that little notch when you open it up. So have a good look down inside, see as much of that pin as you can, which means looking at it all the way around from the inside looking out and from the outside looking in. Very often if you open it, it will open the carabiner up again. It will show you a bit more of the pin on the hinge. So unscrew the, the screw gate again and then open the gate and then have another look down at that pin, the hinge pin. The hinge pin, the other end. Mind your fingers, Heidi. The one we looked at first. That's it. You soon get used to how, how to hold them so that you're not obscuring the view. Now, is there any debris or anything got filled um, up inside there? Yeah, it's a bit. Yeah. So this is when your handy paintbrush comes out or your handy wire rope brush or something like a paper clip straightened out, something like that, that you can fish all that stuff out. Because if you can't see the metal, you can't inspect it. Um, mm. Perhaps give it a good blowout. That will probably take that out, I would imagine. It's probably dust or something. There you go. Look at that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there's, all, there's all sorts of stuff in there. Cable ties are really useful things. All kinds of. And just mind your face as you flick it out, whatever it is. Sometimes it can be iron filings. <laughs> but is it bits of carabiner, for example? Mm. Or is it just bits of dust and fibres from ropes and that kind of thing? It uh, so looks like some of... oil. Yeah, could well be. And the more oil you put in it, the more debris it's going to attract. Um, okay. 
you know, Vaseline, rosin, who knows? But it's worth having a good look inside, give it a squirt out with WD or something that will clear it away. Um, you could even rinse it under the tap if you need to, provided you get rid of all the water and dry it out afterwards. Yeah. Um, can you see any play? Can you slide that hinge side to side so that it allows the gate to move? Does it wobble? Okay. Look for cracks around the edge of the pins. That's it, yep, side to side. Any sort of untoward movement. It wants to be a nice clean join on the hinge. It doesn't want to be a wobbly hinge. Good. Solid. <laughs> yep. And then you repeat the same process on the pin the other end where it latches, latches into that notch. And you can see the pin better, of course, and this is often you'll see things on there that you now recognize on the other pin. So you can be quite forensic. Push it open so that you can see the pin altogether. Is it bent? Is it straight? Is it still symmetrical? Yeah. It stick out the same eye. That's the one. Does it stick out the same either side? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Now, now hold the latch open, but screw the screw gate up. Because very often that will tell you things that you can't see. You don't want it to come off the end, obviously. Sometimes they, they come to a stop. Sometimes they're actually loose. But it exposes stuff that you couldn't have seen before, where your thumb is, because that was covered by the gate before, wasn't it? The sleeve. Mm. And now's the time, once you've cleaned it, once you've inspected it, now's the time to give it a, a little drop of spindle oil or whatever the manufacturer recommends. Now turn your attention to the notch that it sits in. So when you, if you imagine snapping it shut, where that pin hits, look for any deformation. Yep. Are the edges yep. becoming sharp? Yeah, exactly. If you imagine whacking the pin across onto there, you could actually flatten the edges so you start to create sharp edges. And that can cut webbing as you clip into things or ropes as you cut, you know, try and squeeze it over the thimble. And it's pretty unlikely you're going to see any cracks, but because the material's a lot thinner there, you might actually see some cracks. So give it a good clean over, maybe even just give it a rub over with something like a scotch bright pad, something like that, just to get any dirt off. Okay, so we're fairly sure that there's no damage there. So now you can let the gate go back to where it should sit. Yeah, yeah, screw that back. So return a card that you'd expect to look. And now run your thumbnail all the way around the bearing surface on the inside of the carabiner. If you imagine sliding it around another carabiner, that's it. Use your thumbnail, not your thumb flesh, the nail, edge of your nail, that's it. And that'll if there's any defects there, you'll pick that up before you see it, probably. You could almost do it in the dark. And if there is anything there, that's where you'd expect it to be, isn't it? Where things bear at the, the opposite ends. Does that feel nice and smooth all the way around? Yeah, it feels really smooth. Okay. Now do the same thing to either side, the bits that you haven't run your nail around, as it were. And no side. That's it. Yeah. Because we saw some marks before, didn't we? Yeah, there's some... I right. don't know if, it, if it's paint, maybe, or... Yeah. It's kind of... <laughs> So that's when you scotch bright pad or Brillo pad or something like that, scour. Nothing aggressive, but you don't want to damage your hands either. I'd hesitate to say a bit of emery cloth because that might mm. actually take material away or take the coating, um, the, the finished plate away. So have you picked up anything which you think might be a, a loss of material? No, it seems smooth apart from just the yeah this stuff. <laughs> Yeah, okay, so is that all the same? It looks to me just there, is that not a transverse groove cut into the metal? That's what it looks like. It looks like a definite mark. Can you not get your nail stuck in that as you drag it round? The other side? Keep Here? the other end. There, keep going, keep going. Just just there, yeah. Where right. keep going back. Back, back, stop just there. What's that mark? There's no indentation. It's, no, it's it's smooth. Okay, it doesn't it looks like it's a Literally. somebody's hacksaw and a line into it. Cool, well, that's all right. 
Now hold the carabiner up and see if there's any twisting. So look at it in both planes. That's it. And if you've got access to a flat piece of, of metal that you know is flat, obviously, or even, I suppose, concrete, if you know it's really flat, if you've got any doubts, it will actually rock on the flat surface, won't it? You can use the side of a steel beam or something like that. It looks good to me, but it's very difficult to tell from a distance. Of it, won't it? Indeed. Now, obviously, you've got the problem with the screw gate. So turn it so the screw gate's facing you and the spine is against the steel. That's it. Works. Nice and flat. Yeah. Uh, test it along the back of the carabiner as well, where the dirt and where the, the glue was or whatever it was. That's it. Any rocking? Obviously, there will be on the curves, but other than that, so it's, there's no air no. gaps. Yep, that's good. Nope. So assuming we know that carabiner belongs to Aerial Edge and we've got a batch number or something we can tie it to, which you'd be able to determine from the paperwork, yeah. you can put that back in storage. Excellent. Um, just whilst we're there, um, there's a couple of other carabiners that Heidi's been mm -hmm. keeping safe just for you. Um, yep. Do you want to demonstrate the gates on those ones, Heidi? Because these yep, are ball lock really carabiners. Handy. Ball lock carabiners. Probably, probably illustrate what we've been talking about and what we've been looking for. That's one poke stuck. Yeah, so the spring's definitely suffering there, isn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. And in fact, it probably won't affect its load bearing um, capacity once it's locked shut. No. But um, I know that the manufacturer will say that's a discard criteria, as they call it. Yeah. So uh, is we've that been... one of the ones with a plastic sleeve? No, it's a metal sleeve, but it's metal a plastic one. button. With a button, yeah. So a William, or whatever they used to call them. Yeah. yeah, I know they had a lot of trouble with the plastic ones for kind of not surprising reasons, really. Yeah, Th yeah. those have seen some duty. Yeah, absolutely. You could, the anodizing is a really useful thing because you can see where the wear and tear has taken place. It's a bit like the, the, the wear and tear you get on the white lines in the middle of the road, you know, skid marks and what have you. Um, yeah. It tells you how sharp the bend is. Yeah, yeah. so the, these ones have been good to us from the point of view of these were the ones that we would uh, clip into people's harnesses for uh, lunge yeah. lines or for flying trapeze. Yeah. Um, just because they're light, because they're near the performer, um, but also yeah. because they're snap shut and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. they're easy to use. Good. Well, while we've got that there, look at all the information at the end <laughs> of your index finger, as it were, on the spine there, because they've got a flat surface. Um, obviously, they take the opportunity of telling you that it's Petzl and it's a William because it's shaped like a pear. Took me a while to figure that out. Um, I think the serial number's etched in on the left-hand side, isn't it? In tiny, tiny uh, Right letters. by the hinge. Right uh, there. Yeah. Mm. Uh, where so once you get to know the product, you'll know exactly where to look. And for most people, you, you often tend to buy the same type of carabiner. Flip it over on the other side so we can see what's on there. Reverse. There you, there go. you go. So minimum braking strength. Patch number. C0082. Not, uh, yeah, sorry, yeah. Yeah, 27 kilonewtons in line with the long axis, 8 kilonewtons across cross loading, so it's nice and strong cross loading, and 8 kilonewtons with the gate open. Nice. And it's also got UIAA, which isn't just a batch number, that's the um, Alpinist, International Alp Alpinist Association, <laughs> and, which, if for climbing products, manufacturers will make it conform with uh, as many standards as they can, obviously. So you've got a few little dents and biffs on there. Oh, yeah. um, what you do in that situation, you, that's it, you found it with your nail, fantastic. So now you thought, oh, I'm not sure about that. So you go to Petzl's website or the documentation that came with it, and they'll tell you that if that groove is more than a millimeter deep, that's the end of life. Yeah. Because when you get beyond a millimeter, you can get sharp edges occur, and that, that becomes a, an, an issue. Um, but you've got to know what the manufacturer recommends. That, that's absolutely the, uh, the watchword. Excellent. Very good. Um, should we take a look at some of the Mayons that are sitting there? Yeah, sure. So, um, uh, are you looking for it? Um, so, in fact, let's look at the bow shackle at the top. There's, um, there's a, a, a black bow shackle just hanging out there. Okay, well, let's apply the same theory. So, first off, is it yours? 
Oh yeah, I remember buying a way that. of telling, and obviously every company, every organisation has its own way of doing that. Yeah. Um, of course, the sad reality is it's beautifully uh, oh, yeah. stamped up, as it were, but that's obscuring the material that we want to inspect. Yeah. And will that slide, that, that label? I don't think it will, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, um, the the serial number on there is, uh, I, know, I know the source is Imogen Mitchell, because that's the IM, yeah. and the SH-34 yeah. is the, I think that's SH-34 is, is yeah. then um, the ones that we Got bought, and number. you can see the number yeah, on the side there as well. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. So, is that telling you that it belongs to Imogen? Well, um, as telling you, it did belong to Imogen, and she sold them to Aerial Edge. Oh, okay. Um, so, yeah, well, there's, there's no reason, but to inspect it, really, you're going to take that if off. it's been used for anything heavy duty, you've got to be able to move that out of the way, or yeah. if the worst comes to the worst, cut it off, yeah. Yeah, no, okay. I mean, we bought those mid-pandemic, so they're yet to go through yeah. um, an inspection. Sure. Well, then I'm sure they would be absolutely fine. Oh yeah. So what we do now is we look for a manufacturer. So uh, is there a mark anywhere that tells you who manufactured it? Nothing obvious on there, is there? But if you hold it, hold it up so we can see the marks at the top next to the C mark. It says LG. Does it say? It does. Yeah. Not one I'm familiar with. But I'll make a guess that it's come from lifting gear in Manchester. We can see it's got a working load limit of three and a quarter tons. Got a CE mark, then the manufacturer's mark, then the fact that it's made from grade six material. F1, I would imagine, is probably the batch number that it came with. And underneath the Imogen's tape, um, it'll say five stroke eight, which is five eighths, which is its traditional trade size, five eighths of an inch diameter. And then on the head of the pin, the screw in pin, you should see some more information. So again, it will give you a batch. Yep. QF3-6. So again, I'm, I'm guessing it's either because they've used six to one or it's because it's this grade six material. And on the back of the pin, it might have something else on the other side. Well, there is a little mark, but I'd have to check what that was with the manufacturer. But we've got a a fairly reasonable chance of finding how, out who that is just by using Google, to be honest. But because we know its provenance, the thing to do is just ask Imogen where she bought them from, yeah. or hopefully look at the paperwork that I, she sold them uh, with. She did indeed <laughs> supply full paperwork, of course. There you go. And that's exactly what you want to do. While we've got that um, frame, so to speak, you can see it underneath the blue, if it is blue, I'm colorblind, that yeah, label with Imogen's mm -hmm. name on it. Yeah. Um, there's a flat surface being put on there for you. Yeah. And that flat surface is so that you can stamp your own or etch oh. your own numbers in. Wow. Because previously it was just a round surface, and you can imagine um, you've got to hit it quite hard to get a font punch to, um, <laughs> to read properly if it's a curved surface. So anything that up above half inch diameter, I think they now put a flat on there for you. You see it on eye bolts and things all the time, but you've got to be very careful not to stamp unless the manufacturer um, right. says you can. Yeah, I think um, uh, Imogen's obviously etched uh, SH-34 onto that one. Yeah, it probably won't go beyond the, um, the plating, so that's not going to affect the material inside, but yeah. it'd be better to use the flat provided really. Interesting. Now in terms of inspection, because we've only been through the first level of filter now, I guess now we we should be able to to get hold of the criteria from the manufacturer, which is all going to be pretty much of a much to be honest. Yeah. Is it deformed in any way? A quick way of telling is to take take the pin out, and if that comes out relatively easily, there's no binding on the thread. Then there's a good chance that it's not being twisted in the plane that the pin was in. Now put the pin in from the wrong side. That's it. And if you had encountered a sticky thread, screw it all the way in. The wrong side? Yeah. yeah. If, that, if that flies in with ease, you'll know there's no problem with the thread. Now, if you imagine if you were unscrewing it and you encounter some tightness, you could imagine it's the thread. Well, you've just proved by doing that that it isn't a thread. So mm -hmm. if if it had been stiff taking it out, that indicates there's a strong possibility that the body of the shackle has been bent some way so that it prevents the pin leading into the thread correctly. 
and you'll notice the one side's threaded, the other side's got quite a big hole in comparison. Mm -hmm. It's not just because it's not being threaded, but it's to allow a bit of movement because when you put three and a quarter tons on it, the whole thing's going to shift around slightly and you don't want it to bind. So it's important for the pin to be able to go in and locate because the pin isn't a bolt. It works like a beam supported at each end, if you imagine. Uh, this is why it's good practice to put the load in the middle. Now, hold it up like you did the carabiner and see if you can see any twisting. You can even put it on the on the steel beam like you did before if you're not sure. If it looks as if it's absolutely fine, and it does to me, but obviously I'm looking via several lenses at it, it looks pretty good. Now do the thumb trick. Run your thumb around the inside and see if there's any reduction in material thickness. And again, if it's had any significant wear, you'll feel it before you see it nine times out of ten. Mm -hmm. And there doesn't, if they're supplied painted black, which it looks as if they are, there's no real loss of paint anywhere, is there? So it doesn't look like it's had any wear and tear to speak of. There's a little bit missing on the inside there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, is there any material being lost there? Has it been done by a wire rope or a fiber rope or a sling? Because a fibre rope or a, a round sling, for example, that's not going to wear anything away at all, really. But in terms of the material, it's just taken the paint off, hasn't it? Yeah, it seems like it. It's just mm -hmm. a paint. Now, what you've got to be careful of is if that, for some reason, offends you aesthetically, um, I can't think it would, but if you're worried that people can see the shiny surface, then don't paint it again. Mm -hmm. um, if you do paint it again, Give it a good clean and take some of the surrounding paint off before you paint it black because you could easily be literally papering over the cracks. Right. Okay. Really important. Same with trusses. Yes. Yes, indeed. Makes and sense. then just before you finish, just look at the pin and make sure the pin is straight. We know the thread's good, um, but there's no loss of material there. You haven't got a groove worn in it. That happens quite a lot. Or you haven't ended up with a depression yet. You can see that something's been bearing on it. Um, but whatever it is, quite thin, and I would have thought it was probably, probably a carabiner or a mile, actually, or an O-ring. Yeah, so that looks pretty good. No sharp edges in terms of hand injury or any other part of the body injury in your world, because sometimes that hole in the pin, you can get quite sharp edges if people have put a bar through there to loosen it off. Nope, it's fine. Excellent. Nope. Excellent. Very good. So... You said you've got the paperwork, so yep. you, you've got that one logged, as it were, and you can put it back in the bin, wherever you keep it. I don't mean refuse bin, <laughs> I mean storage bin. <laughs> so we've got, um, we're about 45 minutes in um, with yes. this. Do we yes. want to look at um, another connector like a Mayon, or do we want to go onto pulleys or onto circus equipment? It, entirely up to you, Mark. I'm very um, conscious of the time. But let's, go, let's, go for a, let's go for a pulley. It just goes to show how long it actually takes to do one carabiner. Obviously, yeah. you get used to doing it quicker. Yeah, yeah, yeah go for it. Uh, let's let's pull that one up, and uh, yep. we'll nice swing cheek pulley. So, first thing is the information. Can we read it? Is it there at all? Because sometimes there's absolutely nothing written on them. So, have you got a manufacturer or what you perceive to be a manufacturer? I mean, if you bought it, you probably know. But if you haven't bought it, there's no way of telling, have you? Have we got a manufacturer on there. There we go. Um, Strux. Marvellous. Not known to me. Not known to me either. <laughs> I'm sure it can be Googled. It meets an EN for, I think that's rescue carabiners. Um, it gives you the rope size, which is always useful to know. So the, the shiv's been machined for less than 14 millimeter diameter. Um, under your thumb there on the left hand side, we've got some load information. Um, and given the nature of the <laughs> the, the value of the kilonewtons, I can tell you that's a braking load, not a working load limit. So uh, it's designed um, to lift less than that, but that's probably up to you to determine as the user. They've given you the braking loads there. I'm surprised it doesn't say braking load actually. Okay, we got any information on the other side? No, no, no. Yeah. completely plain. Okay, anything under that tape? Because at this point, if you're looking for information, it might be hidden. It might have obscure defects as well. I can't see if any. 
Okay, so all we've got is some sticky glue. <laughs> and always be very careful because I can, yeah, I can understand you wouldn't want sticky glue on your gear, but be very careful what you use to get it off with. Uh, it's very easy to grab a can of nail varnish remover, which is very effective, or brake fluid, mm -hmm. um, but you don't know what damage it's doing to the material necessarily. If there's plastics involved, probably less of an issue on, on metal. But if you are going to use something like that, make sure you rinse it off because it's not going to do your ropes any good, probably. Right, so assuming we found some manufacturer's information, um, now we can start to look at the overall condition. So think about how a pulley is used. It's going to be hung up at the top, and it's going to have something, a rope passed over it, and pull that down the other way. So what's happening? Where's the, the, the strain going to be seen? Where your thumb is at the top, so that's where you apply the thumb thumbnail test, and the, 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 the axle of the wheel at the other end. So have a look at see if there's any material being lost at the top there. I can see some of the anodizing chipped away, but is there any ma material being lost? Do you think? Was that fairly? It doesn't. It's a little bit different. No? Fairly clean, just a bit fuzzy around the edges. Yeah. yeah. They're not sharp, though, are they? The edges. No. Because if they were sharp, they could easily cut slings and things. Mm. Okay. Now the 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 shaft on the the pulley wheel, the shiv itself, is there any play there? Can you grab the two sides, the two plates, and move them relative to each other? Is there any wobble or wiggle? A little bit. Yeah, there is, isn't there? Have you got another one? The same? We have a few. I th you haven't got one the same, though, I don't think. I think that's a one-off. It's a, a really good thing. If you've got more of the same, comparison is a fantastic way of... We don't have any. No? Okay, never mind. But it's worth thinking about that. It's the same with the carabiners or anything else. If you've got another one, or another two or three or four, um, it's a really quick way of checking whether it's normal. So that, to me, looks like it's had a bit of wear and tear. Can you see down into the shaft where the, where the, the wheel rotates? This is where a, a little torch or an inspection lamp or something is useful. Because if you can see any defects or any damage or any material that's been worn away, you know, iron filings, as it were, that are coming out. I'm, I don't know that, that type. There may be a bearing in there. I've no idea. But it looks to me like that's starting to wear a bit loose. Yeah. 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 Normally, I'd expect those two. You can see how the, the, the cheeks of the pulley are angled so that they sit together in the carabiner side by side. So I would, yeah, that looks to me to be a bit excessive. Now, the way to, to do or for the, for the future, next time you buy a new one, is measure it before you start using it and see how much of a gap there is. Even use feeler gauges in, inside. There's all sorts of ways you can do it because that will give you an indication how much wear and tear has taken place and if necessary you can phone the manufacturer and you'd probably guess what the answer will be but you can say look I've got a gap of five millimeters at the top and I can guarantee they'll tell you to get rid of it yeah I mean most of the pulleys that we've got there are petrol or DMM um, but that yeah, one was a, was a was an oddball one pulled out to the side a road so, now if yeah. you can you be, be a carabiner at the top and then try and wiggle the wheel inside the plates so pinch it together, that's it. Now, can you get the wheel by itself and try and wiggle it? Okay, so imagine you've got, make your fingers the rope. Yeah, and the other way, side to side. Rather than round and round, side to side. That's it. Is there any wiggle there? Yeah. yeah. Hold, hold the plate still and the wheel's moving, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's, I, I would say that was excessive wear. Yeah. Given that you've got lots of other ones, I would put that in the in the, the black museum so you can show yeah. other people what wear looks like. Yeah. That's good. See how it sits in the carabiner? Nice. Underneath your finger. That's why it's shaped like that, so that it sits in the center. If you're not using it on an oval carabiner, that can be a real real problem. Yeah, we find I mean, that. It'll cause it to wear. That may have been what's happened. Because if you imagine that in a D-shaped carabiner or an offset carabiner, um, as you put load on the rope, the two the plates are being pulled in, in different directions. Yes. Yeah. Very good. With high revolution, that could could cause wear very quickly. 
indeed. Should we take so, a quick? Yeah. Should we take Seen a quick? One. Yeah, thank you, Chris. <laughs> should we take a quick look at some circus equipment? Yeah, absolutely. Um, should we take a wander up to the other end, and we'll? Uh, th there's a few bits of equipment that we'll pass along the way. Um, yep. One of those being um, a trampoline. Um, yep. The other of that being um, a teeter board. Um, but yep. if we head up to the the trapeze as well, so. Um, we obviously inspect all of the equipment that we have in use, um, including trampolines and, and other mm. elements like it. And obviously that, that's, uh, that, that takes a lot longer than a carabiner. Oh, yeah. For sure. <laughs> um, and um, we're... You have to take it apart, I think. Yeah. <laughs> we do. Uh, that one's just been put back together. Um, there we go. A handy trapeze. Aha, uh -huh. right. So... Um, Let's have a look at that. So uh, what are we looking for on a, on a standard trapeze? Well, I think the same rule applies to, to everything else. Give yourself enough light, space, time, um, possibly a magnifying glass or whatever. If you know who made it, I would ask them for detail, or if you can see it, ask them for detail of how the rope um, joins the thimbles and how the thimbles join the bar. Um, Those are definitely end. fire toys trapezes by the looks. Okay, of so you could phone Nick up. Yep. Um, let's look at the other end where the rope goes around the thimble onto the bar. Is that welded on? Is it pinned on? That's welded. There's all, welded. Yeah, there's all sorts of different ways. So if it's welded, you need to be able to see the weld. Because you can put a lot of leverage on there. So the rope's yeah. been spliced around the thimble after it's been welded on. Um, if you can see the one side, it would be nice to be able to see both sides. Um, there may be a way of doing that, I don't know, without getting too destructive. <laughs> but if you've any doubt at all, yeah, there you go. So they've designed it with that in mind. Haven't they? Yeah. But if you've any doubt at all, um, you know, have a word with them, because it, that's the advantage of knowing where you bought it from, and they're a reputable company. Yeah, absolutely. We can see so there's that, a bit of whipping nice. coming away there. Yeah, absolutely. That would be my starting point. Yep. Um, in a sense, I quite like that because as the whipping comes away, you can see underneath it rather than mm. having to take it off simply to, you know, it just gives you a sort of a, a control mechanism, as it were. Yeah. Um, and if you do repair it, then obviously you take it off and you can see underneath. It gives you an indication as to the wear overall. Um, the rope, is that cotton rope? Uh, I think so. Yeah, it looks like it, but it's quite difficult to see from here. It's definitely so, not sort of polyester anyway, but yes, it's no, just it's cotton, right? It could be a mix, but yeah. the, the, the issue with cotton is that it doesn't like impacts particularly well. So it's nice and stretchy, but where it's been stretched over the thimble there, and if it's dropped on the floor, um, you know, swagged out the way and it hits the wall or something like that, where it's got a piece of metal underneath it, it's not going to last very long. So just think about, it's a bit like injuries, isn't it? Think about the mechanism of injury what's caused it and how much is left and as far as i can see from there there doesn't look to be anything particularly gruesome to be honest um, might need retaping yeah absolutely on the bar itself well that's that's what i would consider to be beyond my competence because i'm <laughs> i'm not an aerialist and if you said that's really dangerous um i'd say well you know i'll look at the load bearing bits and you look at the the comfort bits the the you know the effectiveness of it um the splice isn't coming apart it's been nicely made and it's been seized at either end which makes a lot of sense in terms of strength it's massively massively stronger than you will ever need it to be yeah um, so yeah. really it's a, a question of if it's a natural fiber make sure it's kept in the dry and yeah. um, if you follow the rope up to sort of mid mid length where you can easily get hold of it grab it with both hands and then twist in opposing directions to open up the lay. Not much, because you don't want to put a hockle in it. You, don't want, it, you want it to go back afterwards. But just open it up so you can see inside the, the strands. You might need to move your hands close together. That's it. There you go. Now, have a smell of it. And if it smells rotten, <laughs> it is. <laughs> <laughs> it smells of old socks, and that's probably about right. <laughs> if it's like your practice socks, it's about right. It's probably so, exactly what it is. <laughs> work your way up all the way along the rope look for the obvious I mean you know cuts um, it's most likely going to be um, right you know you, you've perhaps taken it on, on the road and it's got a bit of rough treatment 
normally with cotton rope, if you see any loose ends like there are on the end of the splice, but somewhere else, then I would worry. Um, but, you know, you've got to cut thread. It's got to go somewhere, hasn't it? But mm -hmm. that looks all fairly together to me. Because once it starts to get cut under load, it will start to fray open. Yeah. It's very, very visible. Yeah. You can so see... Really, I would see Sorry, Sorry Mark, you, you, no, I was going to say, yeah, I mean, you can see there's a little bit of furring. Yeah, absolutely. But it's fairly general, isn't it? It's not localised in one particular area. Yeah. Um, same as slings. I'd always be worried if there was one particular area that was going, it, because it's a natural fibre. and you know, the, It's a fairly basic process. There, there you go. That's starting to go, isn't it? Yeah. But it's not yeah. being used over a pulley. Um, yeah. One would hope it's not being sort of rubbed up and down against a brick wall or something like that. That may have been what caused it. Um, under load that could do it some damage but I wouldn't worry unduly about that yeah, it's um, unless, where, it starts, where? unless it starts to behave peculiarly and you can feel that one side's not working the same as the other side yeah. where that's sitting it looks uh, somewhat like um, the position when people are inverting and going to um, yep. putting their yep. feet up at that particular angle so it's just the right height for that two and yep. a half metre trapeze length for, right. for that to be um, uh, gaiters or something like that that's affecting it. Yeah, I was going to say, take your boots off. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then if you go to the other end where the metalwork is, you know, you've got a pear shaped myon or something through the thimble. Now, because they've been made by people that care, I can tell, um, that thimble probably got put through the myon before the splice was made. But very yeah. often, you'll see, if you imagine trying to get that myon onto the, the eyelet, with the rope there, the yeah. gate isn't big enough, and it, you'll actually get cuts in the rope. Yeah. Or if yeah. people try to replace it, so that's really important. So look at the rope all the way around the eye, and just make sure there's no cuts or that the lay's not opening up. It's being forced apart as somebody's tried to squeeze it over. You imagine if you open that mayon up, is the gate opening is not big enough as a rule to get yeah. over the top yeah. of the uh, the rope. Yeah. Now, when you the rope, the the shackle and the mail itself, same rules apply as previously. The the mail should have quite a bit of information on it, albeit written in tiny, tiny writing. Um, but it should have a C mark on it, really, oh, yeah. because it's been painted. You might have to get the paint off, but made in France. Yeah, so it's a genuine mail rapide. Yep. Excellent. Well, you can't do much better than that. But apply the same principle. So good overall condition. Do the thumbnail test. Make sure it's not twisted. And you've got two together. So you might have to take them apart as best you can, but lie them next to each other and just compare one with the other. And if you have got any significant defamation, it will scream at you, honestly. Yeah, very good. So we're often in the situation where we have uh, manufactured equipment of uh, varying different uh, providences um, and we can, uh, not, exactly not, that. not all of it comes with um, with uh, paperwork um, yeah. and not all of it um, has um, you know any idea of who manufactured it at all or where it came from right so I think, yeah, you know, you've got to be careful I mean in my experience there are people with a circus background who now make props. I can think of quite a few, I'm sure you can. Yeah. Um, you know, good, bad or indifferent, at least you know where they are, who they are, mm. and you can phone them up and say, what should I be looking for? They might have experience of failures. You know, we all get things wrong from time to time. And they can say, ah, glad you phoned. Have a look at the weld at the top end of the thing or, you know, the bottom of the aerial pole or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they can be very helpful. And I'm sure they, inevitably, they will have used if only their own experience, they would have used some sort of standard um, to, to manufacture it and they'll be able to help you out. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you really genuinely don't know, then it's common sense time, really. Yeah. Yeah. Measure it before you start using it, use it in a, a controlled way, measure it again and see if it's still the same, etc. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. So if, if you just turn around and uh, give a quick look towards the teeter board as a as a piece of equipment. So obviously there's a lot of uh, different elements uh, that are in that. Yeah. And I'm not going to delve into that too deeply, deeply but that's yeah. made from 10 pole vaulting poles yeah. um, and sandwiched together uh, with wooden steel uh, with yeah. pads on either end and a frame um, on the floor. And uh, yeah. um, that was uh, um, 
uh, teeter board we bought from Sibling Alliance, which they had made in Australia and has travelled all over the world. So mm. um, part of um, taking that on in the first place was then showing us how to check and maintain yeah. it so that we yeah. could actually do that. So um, even though uh, it was manufactured by the artists themselves, um, yeah. it was in use for many, many years before it came to us. Mm. Um, so we took the approach of uh, getting them to show us how to maintain it, um, how to uh, go through, how, understand how it was manufactured and what yeah. some of the pitfalls are and uh, where to get replacements for any of the parts from. I was going to say, I mean, keeping it, keeping it running is probably the thing, isn't it? What if you sort of try and copy some of the bits, is it actually going to do more harm than good? And having yeah. that, that, presumably you've still got a phone number you can call if you need to. Oh, yeah. To. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. I, I guess with that sort of equipment, um, injury in using it rather than it breaking and injuring you is probably um, as much of an issue. Sharp edges, corners. <laughs> yeah, uh, D depends, you know, get, depends who's teaching it, but yes. <laughs> but, you know, getting caught behind the back of the knee with the corner of one of those platforms or whatever yeah. could could be painful. No, it um, is. What I was looking at the bolts that underneath the Union Jack, as it were, that are plating it to sorry, the Australian plate, anyway. Right? Thank you. Um, <laughs> <obviously, laughs> those bolts, there appeared to be a nut which had either worked loose or has never been yep. tight. Um, yeah. Which you know may be irrelevant, but things like that. Yeah, it's you, definitely you what we're looking at. Develop a, a sixth sense, as it were, yeah. um, and anywhere where you've got movement one part against another. So, is carbon fiber or GRP or whatever going to be affected in any particular way? Does it produce a residue that you can see on the floor? Yeah, um, you know that kind of thing. Yeah, indeed. No, but good. Again, if, you, if you keep your eye on it and you you um, you think, oh, that doesn't look right. Quick phone call, and they say, oh no, it always does that. <laughs> you know, and then you know. Um, Entirely. Very good. Okay, well, I mean, um, as far as equipment's uh, concerned, we can spend an awful lot of time with an awful lot of different pieces of equipment. Yeah. Um, but um, any sort of guidelines that you would give uh, that we haven't covered um, already with any other sorts of equipment? Well, I think you apply the same principles to all of it. Common sense overall, you know, if you're not sure and there's a risk in using it and you might hurt yourself or somebody else, then don't. It really, it's not important, is it? Or not that important. And um, if you do condemn something, make damn sure that nobody else is going to take it out of the skip like I would, you know, because <laughs> it's amazing what you can find in skips. Just make it impossible to use. So if it's yeah. a sling with an eye, cut the eye so nobody can, and if they do use it, they've really got to work hard, you know, then they have to take some responsibility for that. Um, yeah, if they just think that somebody's left something out on the street, like a teeter board, um, wow. you know, cut it in half, yeah, cut it in half. <laughs> well, each one of those pole vaulting poles, if you went to replace um, them from new, are around about four hundred to four hundred and fifty pounds. Yeah. So, um, if you if you cut any of that in half, I'm going to be incredibly unhappy. Good. But you don't want to throw it away with the potential for two. No, absolutely. Jump on it, you know, at the same time, and it's probably the sensible thing is just to take the board off and throw it away, isn't it, and keep the keep the frame as it were. Yeah. Well, I mean that um, that gets used um, on a on a very regular basis. Um, mm. as in a, a part of a circus fitness training as well now. So uh, um, that's a good thing. Mm. And, uh, no, I yeah. think that the general general rule has to be common sense. Um, if you're using it, be happy with its condition and don't just trust to luck. There are There's always somebody you can ask. Um, and if you do get rid of it, just dispose of safely in every, every sense of the word, really. Yeah, that would very much make me cry. Um, but um, <laughs> but good. So I mean, thank you very much again for um, going this, and thanks to the Aerial Edge team for uh, um, being uh, up for um, giving tours around and all of the equipment and um, yeah. making sure everybody could see it. Um, uh, that's been, uh, from my perspective, one of the more one of the most informative um, and detailed ones that we've done on any given subject. So uh, that's been awesome, guys. So thank you very much. Well, we could certainly do some more in sort of more detail about all of the materials that we've looked at, be they natural or artificial fibers, um, carabiners or eye bolts or, you know, other, other things of a similar type. Hmm. Um, hmm. That's really very much just sort of skimming the surface. Yeah. But you, you need to be able to determine whether it, in a percent from the point of view of an organization, if you're putting it out there, it has to be right. Yeah. So you've so got to be... You know, certain and, and record the inspection as well, ideally. Yeah, 
So by recording it, you mean actually making sure you're actually taking the uh, the, the notes um, on uh, you're doing it rather than just video record it. Um, Absolutely. So uh, <laughs> excellent. Um, good. So um, um, thank you for everybody who's watching. The things that are coming up um, over uh, the next. Um, uh, week or so, we've uh, just launched the No Fit State Tent video. Uh, we've just launched a description of um, the rigging and the entertainment industry course um, as part of our series. There, if you want to see Chris talking about it um, from our conference, then um, that's available on the site too. Um, in the next week or two, we'll be launching a video and an article on rigging from truss, um, which um, was a f last month uh, we did um, a, a session with Chris um, on uh, rigging and connectors from truss um, and, and inspecting those sort of up in the air. Um, so we took a lot of that content and um, uh, uh, and also some source material for another video and actually made a separate video about that, which we'll put um, in the members area of the site. Um, but we're also going to write an article um, on that as well, and that will be coming out um, uh, before the next live stream. Um, so a few things to look forward to there. If you've got any questions, then please feel free to reach through to us. Um, and if there's things that you'd particularly like to see or learn about, um, then equally come back through to us and um, send us an email, send us a comment um, here in YouTube, and uh, we'll um, uh, get back to you on that as well. So thanks everybody very, very much. And especially thanks to Chris for giving us the benefit of your expertise. And um, I'll see all of you guys again later. So thanks a lot.